I would like you to all welcome Dr. John Lott, who has done some of the seminal statistical and economic work on the right to keep and bear arms, and I would like to welcome him now because he can explain himself better than I can. Thank you. I was kind of torn today about what to talk about. You know, there's been so much misrepresentation about the stand your ground law over the last few months. But I think it's pretty clear to everybody by now that the Stand Your Ground law wasn't, or at least the aspect of Self-Defense Act regarding Stand Your Ground wasn't really relevant to the Zimmerman case. So I'm going to stay away from that. So I'm going to talk about the spate of multiple victim public shootings that we've been seeing. And I guess I want to start with a question, and that is, why did the killer in the Cinemark Century 16 Theater in Aurora, Colorado, pick that theater? to go and engage as an attack on July 20th. I don't think people realize this, but out of the seven movie theaters that were playing the Batman movie within 20 minutes of the killer's apartment, there was only one Cinemark movie theater that had posted signs banning permanent concealed handguns in the movie theater. Uh, it's kind of a frustrating story for me in terms of finding this out. I finally, after many years pestering Fox and a couple other places, gotten Ken LaCourt to agree to run a story if I could nail down what was there, but it took me about two weeks to finally get this for one movie theater. It was very difficult to contact. But in Colorado, private property owners and businesses are allowed to decide whether to post signs for whether or not people can carry concealed handguns there, you know, just like they can determine whether people get service if they wear shoes or shirts or not. And the vast majority of movie theaters and restaurants and businesses allow customers to be able to go and carry permanent concealed handguns. But there are a few that post, just like you see in most states. It's pretty much the pattern. Uh, a number of states, not all right-to-carry states, allow posting. And uh, you'll initially see a lot of places that post for the first couple of years. But then after a while when they realize that a lot of the fears that they might have had aren't true, then you begin to see the postings being removed. And so using MapQuest and uh, Movies.com, as well as trying vainly to get some groups in Colorado like Rocky Mountain Gun Owners Association and others to try to help out without success, I was finally able to pin down how the different movie theaters, whether they're posted or not. And if you look at within... 20-minute drive, according to uh, MapQuest, of the killer's apartment at 1690 Paris Street in Aurora, you find that the Cinemark movie theater was four miles away. It was about an eight-minute ride. There was another movie theater, the Aurora Plaza, which was only 1.2 miles away, three-minute drive away. And then there was the Harkins Northfield 18. It was about five miles away, a 10-minute drive. And if you call up their hotline, they build themselves as home of Colorado's largest auditorium. And in fact, that was the auditorium that was being used that night for the Batman movie. And so you would think that would be particularly attractive. You have the largest audience there. If you want to go and try to kill as many people as possible, you would think that would also be an attractive target. There are four other movie theaters within 20 minutes. Three were 10 miles away. Uh, another one was 13 miles away. Now, if you go and look at media reports after the attack, there's, there's a number of media reports that do mention that the attack occurred, quote, near the killer's apartment. But it's kind of implied from the reports that this was the closest movie theater when, in fact, as I just mentioned, there was only one that was 1.2 miles away as opposed to 4 miles away. And no discussion there, no analysis of what the other movie theaters were like or whether one was even closer or not just simply the statement that it was near his apartment. And why then would a, would the killer pick this movie theater to go and do it? And I guess for this audience, it's not particularly a novel question to go and ask. But it raises the general issue about who obeys these types of laws. And it's not just limited to these gun-free zones. It's a question that's relevant for all types of gun control regulations. Because if you end up with a situation where it's basically the most law-abiding good citizens who obey the laws and not the criminals, so you disarm law-abiding citizens relative to criminals, you can actually have 
the opposite of what we'd like to have happen. You can have these types of bad events. You know, and I suppose, you know, we've seen this type of discussion in many places. You, you look at something like the Virginia Tech attack in which 32 people were killed. You know, again, it's understandable. The idea is if you just ban guns in certain areas, you'll make them safer. But, you know, in a state like Virginia, there are very few places where permit concealed handguns are banned. Universities are one of the very few places where that's true. But if you're a professor, let's say, and you're able to carry your permit concealed handgun virtually any place in the state except for school property, if you carry it onto school property and you get caught, what's going to happen? You're going to get fired for a firearms-related violation. If you get fired as an academic for a firearms-related violation, what do you think the probability of being able to go and get another academic position someplace else in the United States is? About as close to zero as you can get. You know, if you're a student, over 21, and have a permit, again, you're able to carry it virtually any place in the state. If you carry it onto school property and you get caught, you're going to get expelled. Maybe it's not quite as close to zero as it is per professor, but if you get expelled for a firearms-related violation at American University, you're going to find it extremely difficult to go and finish your college education. You're going to have to basically reconcile yourself to the fact that you're never going to get a BA if that's what you're working on, or never able to get a law degree or an MBA or whatever degree that you're working on. So in both of these cases, getting caught in those cases are going to be really life-changing events. If you're the professor, you're basically going to have to reconcile yourself to the fact that you're going to have to find a completely different line of work for your livelihood. And if you're a student, you're going to have to realize you're never going to go and get that degree. Now, if you're the killer, though, and you've already killed 32 people and facing 32 death penalties or 32 life sentences, somehow the notion, that even assuming that he had lived and in the Virginia Tech case, of course, he died, and about 75% of these multiple victim public shootings, the killers die. Somehow the notion that the threat of expulsion from school is going to be the penalty that's going to make the difference more than the 32 death penalties or the 32 life sentences just doesn't seem to me very credible. You know, when you're talking about Colorado, you have about 4% of the adult population with permanent concealed handguns. Apparently, there were several hundred people. The vast majority of them, since it was a midnight showing, apparently were adults or young adults in the movie theater, from at least talking to old police who have been there at the time. And you would think in that type of situation, you'd have an extremely high probability that at least someone, someone who would have been unknown to the attacker, would have had the permanent concealed handgun with them, if they had been allowed to go and take them into the movie theater. Instead, it's pretty clear that no one in Theater 9 at the Cinemark movie theater had a permanent concealed handgun with them. Now, there's been some aftermath, even though none of the other movie theaters within 20-minute drive had posting banning concealed handguns at the time. One of the movie theaters, the Harkin 18 Northfield that I mentioned with the largest auditorium, has since changed its policy, so it's now started to post. But it's not just the Colorado case. You know, the Sikh temple also was a gun-free zone. You go through different mall shootings or other places that have been there, you know, the West Roads Mall in Salt Lake or the mall shooting in Omaha, Nebraska a few years ago. And again, you see the same type of pattern. You know, one mall out of seven posts in Omaha. That's the one where the killer went to. But it's even broader than that. If you look at all these multiple victim public shootings in the United States in which more than three people have been killed, so again, you're talking about a public shooting, not as a result of some other type of crime, not as a result of some type of gang fight that's going on, but where the point of the killing is going to try to just go and kill people or create carnage, with only one exception, every single one of those multiple victim public shootings have occurred in places where permanent concealed handguns are banned. And you'd think at some point, I was hoping this last time would be one of them, you'd actually see news stories that would mention it. You go through and you look at the news coverage in the Colorado case. They have very quickly, they get details about whether the guns were purchased legally or not. They get information on the types of guns, often bogus discussions about assault weapons with little or no understanding about what an assault weapon is in that case. You know, it's almost 
kind of expected that there's going to be some type of discussion about that in these cases. One thing that came up a lot after the Aurora shooting was comparisons to Columbine. And one thing I, that I don't think most people realize is that the killers in the Columbine case were strongly opposed to uh, permit-concealed handguns. In fact, the New York Times had, shortly after the attack, I'll give them credit, though I don't think they recognized the significance of this, had a front-page discussion about how Dylan Klebold had shared with his dad their strong opposition to the concealed handgun law that was being debated in the Colorado legislature at that time. In other places, I've seen discussions about how Klebold wrote to his state legislators. And a couple things just to note. One, the Colorado concealed handgun law that was being considered at that time would have allowed permanent concealed handguns to be carried onto school property. And the other thing that I think is quite striking is that the Colorado attack at Columbine occurred on the very same day that the Colorado State House was scheduled for final passage of the concealed handgun law there in the state. So Michael Moore brings bogus comparisons, claims about bowling, you know, to get the name of his movie. But the very fact that the timing coincided with the pass, the attempt to pass the concealed handgun law had already been passed in the state Senate, and the governor said he was going to sign it, uh, is something that uh, doesn't seem to get talked about in the news. But it isn't just in the United States, this pattern. Europe has about the same per capita rate of multiple victim public shootings as the United States does. I often get calls from people in uh, the European media after we have multiple victim public shootings here in the United States where I'm asked things like, what is it about you Americans in, with your water supply or something? Is there something in there that causes you to go and engage in these multiple victim public shootings? And I've taken over time, particularly after the Virginia Tech attack, to start asking the reporters questions. And so at that time, I would start, I go to get a call from a reporter in Germany and ask me that. And I'd say, well, could you tell me what country in the world has had two of the three worst public school shootings? And he wouldn't know. And I would say, it's your country, Germany, that's had. In fact, Germany's had three of the worst five public school shootings. But the thing is, I think there are a couple things that are going on. One is, you have all these separate countries in Europe, and so people don't kind of aggregate them up together. And also, I think it's just it fits into their mold about what the United States is like versus Europe, and so it, it fits more of a story. Obviously, we have the Norway situation where 69 people were killed. But you look at even Switzerland, a country that doesn't have many gun-free zones. In fact, it didn't have any gun-free zones prior to 1999. And after that time, they designated a few gun-free zones. Basically, they're in government buildings. Over the last decade, there's been several big multiple victim public shootings in, in Switzerland. The largest one at the parliamentary canton of Zug uh, 11 years ago, 14 members of parliament were killed. And in that case, it was in a gun-free zone, a place where guns were banned. And I could go through the history of the United States. I think most of you have some idea here. I'll just skip ahead here. The biggest thing is just when you run into these discussions, it's about assertions about hypotheticals. So Mayor Bloomberg brings these things up about crossfires that might happen where innocents get killed. This is the type of thing where we can go and look up data. I can't find a multiple victim public shooting that's been stopped in the United States by someone with a permit concealed handgun where an innocent bystander has been shot by the permit holder. You know, I know people will go and bring up Empire State Building shooting in which nine bystanders were shot by the two police officers here recently, shot by them. But when you look at permit holders, and maybe it's part because they don't have the legal protections that police officers do, they're much more reticent to fire their guns. And in fact, it's interesting how many of these multiple victim public shootings get stopped without people firing their guns to begin with. And I know Florida here, other places, one could talk about the behavior of permit holders generally, how extremely law-abiding. I just mentioned Florida, maybe there's somebody from Florida who can tell me this, but they recently took it off their website. But they used to have amazingly detailed data that was put up monthly. And from October 1st, 87, up through July 31st of last year, Florida had given out over 2 million permits, the average person having the permit for over 13 years. And yet with millions of people having permits for all that time, there's only 168 who had their permits revoked for any type of firearms-related violation. Now, I could go through 
my work, I could go through a story that just came up this last week of Mother Jones, supposedly some research that they had done. But I think the bottom line, and hopefully we can get the media to begin to cover this type of thing, is that there's one pattern that seems to be consistent across these cases more than anything else, and that they keep on occurring in these gun-free zones, and that these zones, rather than making victims safer, unintentionally serve as magnets for these attacks to occur. If these were random, then they would be occurring mainly in places where guns are not banned. But that's not where they do. Virtually all but one occurs in places in these tiny areas in these right-to-carry states where concealed handguns are banned. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.